Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Stone Ridge. It's great to have you joining us online here uh, this morning. Why don't you give us a little shout out in the chat and let us know where you're watching from and who's watching. It's always uh, intriguing to find out, you know, where people are tuning in from. I'm uh, going to turn it over to the worship team, but before we do that, uh, let me open in a word of prayer. Would you pray along with me? Lord, we're thankful and we're grateful for church this morning, and uh, we dedicate this next hour to you. Uh, we would invite you, Holy Spirit, wherever we're watching, wherever we're meeting, in our homes, you know, in our kitchens, in our living rooms, listening in the car. Um, Lord, would you now uh, just really begin to speak to us? We pray that as we worship you, it would be acceptable in your sight, and we pray, God, that you will be pleased by our time together today. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Well, let's turn it up nice and loud, and I would invite you to sing along as the worship team leads. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Oh, the sun sets free. Oh, it's free and me. Ransom is grace 
good to be together? Amen. <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly. For those of you who are at home, thank you for being with us. For those of you who are able to be here, I wish you could be up here and listen and hear what I hear. Man, man, oh man. Man. Beautiful. If I start crying, <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> Cindy, let's talk about the goodness of God, hey? Okay. Thank you so much, team, for leading us in worship. Uh, our mission moment today, I want to talk to you a little bit about Francois Turcotte. 
uh, with Sembeck. Um, just a personal note, uh, Francois had a, a little bit of a fall in uh, January and uh, fractured some vertebrae. And so we want to be praying along with him and for him, you know, for a good recovery, a speedy recovery, uh, no complications kind of recovery. And, uh, you know, Sembeck is still, you know, very, very busy, uh, about 75 students, uh, you know, going through the program there, and then, you know, they're always uh, looking for new partnerships and cultivating partnerships, you know, as they continue, you know, to train and equip people for ministry, uh, and especially uh, in the province of Quebec, where we know that the need is so high. And it's a great privilege for us to partner along with uh, Francois and the team there at Sembeck. So we're going to pray for them in just a moment or two. Uh, one of the other things I'd like to let you know is that... Um, You know, the board has asked me to announce that we are going to be opening up the nominations for deacons. Uh, So those people are going to be part of our church board uh, coming on for uh, at least a three-year term. And so would you prayerfully consider, first of all, whether you'd let your name stand? And then second of all, uh, you know, is there someone that, you know, you would want to nominate, someone that you think would be a good board member and could serve in that capacity? Uh, If you need more information... There'll be an email going out this week, and that will have some up-to-date information, including, you know, just, you know, how you actually go about doing that. And as always, uh, I just want to say on behalf of myself and the staff and the board, the entire leadership team here, thank you for your continued support of Stone Ridge and for your generosity. Uh, You know, without you, we wouldn't be able to do the types of things that we do here at the church, and the ministry, you know, wouldn't be as vibrant as it is. And so I just want to say a huge thank you to all of you who continue to give sacrificially and regularly, you know, um, you know, your, your planned generosity, you know, through the giving online is is a real blessing and it allows us to just keep doing what we're doing. So uh, before the team come and lead us in one more song, uh, I'm going to pray for us. So would you join me in prayer, please? So Lord, uh, we're grateful and thankful for uh, our church partnerships here that we have in terms of missions. And so we uh, pray for our brother in Christ, Francois, and we pray for a speedy and a good recovery from him from this fall and from this damage uh, that's happened as a result of the fall. We pray, God, that you would just uh, continue to watch over him. We pray that you would use him powerfully for your kingdom purposes as he uh, trains and equips and is involved in leadership in the Sembeck program. And so we pray for that program, God, that you would raise up you know, many leaders Uh, to give great leadership uh, in the province of Quebec and around the world um, to see the kingdom of God flourish and grow. And then, Lord, we pray for uh, potential new deacons coming on board uh, in church leadership here at Stone Ridge. And uh, we pray, God, that you would just superintend that whole process. Uh, We pray for wisdom, for people, for the board, um, you know, as we go through discussions and training, equipping, and as we have interviews, and then ultimately as we present names to the, the membership to be voted on, God, we pray that you would superintend that whole process. You know, we trust you, and we know that you have people who need to lead in this way and serve in this way, and so we just pray that they would come to the forefront now, God. Lord, we're also grateful and thankful for your many blessings to us as individuals. Thank you for the material, financial prosperity that we have in this country. And so, God, as we willingly and joyfully give back a portion to you, we would ask, Lord, that you would use and help us to use these funds to further your kingdom in HRM and around the world. And we pray all of this for Christ's sake and for his glory. Amen. Well, let's sing again as the team leads us. We're going to keep the spirit moving with Chain Breaker. Why don't you rise and we're going to sing. You've been walking the same road for miles and miles. You've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, oh, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. Shake it, say, you got, got shame. He's 
the chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day and the end of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know that just ain't right. There's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, He's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. You got chains. He's a chain breaker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you got chains, he's a chain So God, now as we approach your word, uh, we would ask, Lord, that you would speak to us. Um, this passage that we're going to study today in 1 John, um, is filled with a lot. There's just a, an awful lot of material in a few short verses. So Lord, would you help me to communicate it clearly? And would you speak to us? And would you encourage us? Would you uh, correct and rebuke us where that needs to happen? And would you instruct and train us where that needs to happen? Lord, we want to enter into this time now open to what you want to say and what you want to do in our lives. And we ask all of this in and through Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to continue uh, this series. Uh, this is part two of this series uh, that we started last week in the book of 1 John. And uh, you remember, you know, John's intention in writing the book. You know, he talks about it in 1 John chapter 5. I write these things to you who believe in the name of Jesus Christ that you might know, that you might know for sure that you have eternal life. And so we're looking at 11 tests of what it means to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. What, what does it mean to know for sure that you have salvation, that you have eternal life? And John lays these out, you know, uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And so we're going to be looking at all of them. Remember last week we talked about fellowship. And so I, I wonder if some of you were able to take some steps in fellowship. I, I wonder if some of you are watching with other people, you know, even this morning, uh, you know, to fellowship. I, I know it's kind of weird, but, but I'm taping this now, but I'll be watching myself, you know, in a couple of days' time, and Jen and I, Lord willing, will be watching with, with another family uh, because, you know, we're, we're trying to put this stuff into practice. So John gives us these, these tests, you know, that help us. And uh, each one of these is supposed to be, you know, learned, but it's also then supposed to be applied. And, and they give each of us as Christians an indicator on how we're doing. And so, again, I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm going to ask you again at the end of this message, how are you doing? You know, are you, are you a one on this particular test where you're like, ah, you know what, I don't even think about it, I don't even really care about it? Or are you a 10 and you're like, no, no, all the time, all the time I'm practicing what John's going to talk to us about today. Or do you find yourself, you know, somewhere in the middle? Here's the key thing. The key thing is to sit down and actually recognize that we do need to think about these things. We do need to ponder these things because these are written so that you and I might have assurance. And we don't just do it so we can like tick off a list and say, oh, I have assurance, so now I can keep on going. But no, they're meant to be put into practice in our everyday Christian lives. This morning, we're going to look at test number two. And I've entitled today's sermon, Just Say No. Because John's second test addresses sin in the life of the Christian. And so if you have your Bible, uh, turn to 1 John chapter 1. We're going to look at 1 John chapter 1, uh, verses 8 through to the end of the chapter, which is 8, 9, and 10. And then we'll look at the first two verses of chapter 2. So just five verses this week, but man, oh man, does John pack a lot into just five verses. So 
Here's the test, you know, just so we can get it out of the way right at the start, and you can have it in your mind as we walk through today. Simple faith, test number two is this, is to not willfully and deliberately have sin as a part of your regular lifestyle, of my regular lifestyle. Let me say that again. Test number two is to not willfully and deliberately have sin, ongoing sin, as part of my lifestyle and as part of your lifestyle. So, let's see what John has to say. Now, please, I want to say right at the start, please notice that I didn't say that the test is that Christians never sin. Because, unfortunately, we are going to sin, and I hope it's going to be clear why we do sometimes sin. But what do you do about that sin? That's really what the essence is of this particular test. So John wants us to know that we can overcome sin in our lives, that we can gain victory over sin, that we can get freedom from sinful habits in our lives by understanding three certainties from this passage that we're going to look at today. So here's number one. Number one is everybody struggles. There isn't a person who is watching right now that doesn't struggle with sin in their lives. It's one of the things that actually makes us human. The fact that we all struggle to one degree or another with words, with thoughts, with actions that, that you and I are not proud of. We, we all make mistakes. We, we know this to be true. That's what it means to be human. You know, we say things to each other, we do things to each other that later we regret. We think things that later we're not proud of thinking. And Christians are really no different at all. Just because we've come to faith in Jesus Christ does not mean that we've achieved some perfection. In fact, that's exactly what what, what John is coming against. You remember last week that I mentioned to you about the Gnostics And the Gnostics believe that the supernatural, the spiritual side of who we are as people, that's really all that mattered. What what we do, you know, in the flesh and even, you know, really with our words, those are physical. Those are of this world. They don't really matter at all. But really, it's about my connection with God. And what John is about to tell them and what John is coming against uh, in in this particular uh, passage is that the the Gnostic teachers were telling people that it really doesn't matter what you do or what you say because these are part of the material world. They're part of the physical realm, and the physical realm just doesn't really matter at all. You should be more concerned just with the supernatural, with the spiritual realm. The uh, The Apostle John sorry, doesn't want that kind of teaching to shape his readers and his listeners. So he makes things really, really clear in these five verses. There is such a thing called sin. What is sin? Well, first of all, it's not a very politically correct term uh, in our world for sure. But second, sin is defined by God, not by people. And again, that's not very popular these days. But the standard for sin is not my views or my truth or my reality or my views. And it's not your truth, your reality or your views. I don't determine what's sin and you don't get to determine what's sin. God is the one who gets to determine what is sin. And third, sin then is a deliberate act of the will to choose not to agree with God and to fall short of whatever standard God has set. So John tells us two very, very interesting things about sin as we approach our first verse today, and that is 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And when John uh, uses this term, when he says, uh, if we claim to be without sin, he uses a very, very unique, very, very interesting Greek term. And literally in Greek it would say, um, we do not have sin. What John is talking about here, and the term that he is using to describe sin, is an an inherent quality or an active principle that is in us. So what John is really saying in verse 8 is this, if anyone claims that they do not have sin as part of their makeup or part of their nature, then they don't really understand what sin is, and they don't really understand what God has said about sin. 
In verse 8, what John is referring to is what oftentimes we will call the sinful human nature. The human nature that we were born into. A true Christian, John says, understands that every person is born into this world has a bent or a propensity towards sin. In Psalm 51 verse 5, the psalmist said this, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. See, what John is saying here is that our first parents, Adam and Eve, sinned. They fell short of what God's expectations were. God had set a standard out, and they deliberately broke that standard, and sin entered into God's creation. And all human beings who are you know, descendants of Adam and Eve are born with a sinful nature. That's exactly what John is talking about in verse 8. But then John moves on, and in verse 10, he says something a little different. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Here, John is not talking about the sinful nature that we were born with, but what he's talking about now is the acts of sin, the act of participation, the choice uh, that we make, the act of our will to choose to disobey God and to actually sin. John is using completely different language here because he's referring to something different. He's not referring to the sinful nature. He's referring to specific acts of sin. Wrong choices and individual sins are what he has in mind at this particular time. And so what John is doing here is he's setting out two different things. He's setting out the fact that we have this sinful condition that every human being inherits by virtue of being human, and then we make choices in our everyday lives to fall short of God's commands, God's decrees, God's ways, God's standards. And both of those are sins. So we have this human sinful nature, and we have these acts of sin, whether they be words or thoughts or deeds. And John says, if anyone doesn't recognize that that is our condition and that that is what our propensity is towards, then we're fooling ourselves, and the truth is not really in us. And when John talks in verse 10 about the fact that we have sinned, these acts of sin, he's talking about what theologians call sins of omission and sins of commission. Let me just quickly talk about those. Sins of omission are sins that we commit because we fail to do some things that we're actually supposed to do. So it's, it's, it's not that we've actually done a bad thing, it's that we've failed to do something that God has already commanded us to do. We are inactive in that area. We choose to ignore something that God tells us to do. Examples would be failing to pray regularly, or practice generosity, or tell other people you know, about the good news of Jesus to witness to them, or helping other people, or fellowshipping with one another. And the list goes on and on. But when we don't do those things, those are sins of omission. We're omitting doing something that God has actually commanded us to do. And that's the key. Sins of commission, then, are sins that we knowingly commit this is completely different. We're not leaving something out. We know that something is wrong for us to do. We know that God has spoken on something, and we are choosing to disobey God, and we're choosing to do the very thing that God has commanded us not to do. Sexual sins fall into this area. Lying, stealing, slander, gossip, and the like. And what we have to be really careful of as Christians is that we don't allow any of these, especially these sins, of commission, the ones what we, that we actually do, the sins that we commit knowingly and willingly, we have to be really careful that we don't allow these to become habitual sins in our lives, or what the Bible sometimes calls, in, in, especially in the King James older language, besetting sins. Habitual sins or besetting sins are an area of weakness that we continually struggle with. It can be a, any sin or any area of sin in our lives. But the pattern develops in that we, you know, we, we sin, we confess it, we repent of it, and then we sin, and then we confess it, we repent of it, and then we sin, and we find ourselves 
continually living in a defeated, discouraging cycle. So when we bring verses 8 and 10 together, what do we learn? Well, first, we learn that we are all sinners, born with an inherited, rebellious nature towards God. Second, people, people willingly commit sins against God. And remember, remember again, John is writing here to Christians. He's writing to those who would say that they are disciples of Jesus Christ. Third, he says the result of living with sin, of regularly committing sins, of omitting things that God has told us to do, and because of our sinful nature, believing the lie that we have no choice or no power over sin, is that in verse 8 it says, the truth is not in us, and in verse 10 it says, His word is not in us. What John is teaching here is echoing what the Apostle Paul said in Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And and that's the reality. That's the first thing that I think that John wants to get across to us here is everyone struggles. And we have to acknowledge that. We have to see that. We have to look for that in our own lives. The next thing that John points out is this. Everyone needs full disclosure. Everyone needs full disclosure. John affirms that we have been provided with a remedy for our sin problem, but it requires active participation on our part. There is a remedy. God has a rescue plan, but that rescue plan needs our active participation in it in order for it to actually become effective in our everyday lives. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, we have a very, very familiar verse that tells us what we're to do about our sin problem. If we confess our sins, it says, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here we see the confession, which is really just like agreeing with God. It's really just telling God what he already knows. But it's, a, it's an acknowledgement that God has a standard and that I or you broke that standard. And whether we, it was a sin of omission, we didn't do some things that God has commanded us to do, or we did some things that God has commanded us not to do, that you and I are agreeing with God. We are seeing it from God's perspective. And confession is simply acknowledging before God what we have done and agreeing with Him. But the result is, that we receive forgiveness and purification. We need full disclosure if we're going to find forgiveness and cleansing. And John's words carry the idea of removal of sin, which we have committed, and the cleansing of the effects of that sin in our lives. Purification. The past, with all of its mistakes and regrets, is dealt with when we confess. And because of forgiveness and purification, we have hope for our future. And I love what John is doing here. If you, if you picture it this way, 1 John 1, 9 is right in the middle. Here's this verse right in the middle. And it is bracketed on either side. On, on the one side with verse 8, it's bracketed with the fact that we are born sinful. We have a sinful human nature. And it's bracketed on the other side with verse 10 that says that we have sins that we then commit, sins of omission, sins of commission. But right in the center of it is the thing that we need to focus on. And that is if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, a quick word about confession before we go much further. Confession is a serious business. You know, I remember when our kids were little, you know, you, you would, you know, you'd come to them or you'd catch them doing something and right away, you know, out of their mouth, oh, I'm sorry, Dad, I'm sorry, right? And you're like, sorry for what? <laughs> And sometimes, you know, we come to God and we just say, oh, I confess my sin. Blanket statement, I confess my sin. And God might be saying to some of us, sorry for what? Confession needs to be accompanied by a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. A convicting work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need to ask God for godly sorrow that leads us to repentance That we see our sins of omission and commission and we see our sinful nature really as what it is and it's an affront to God. And it breaks our fellowship with God and with one another. 
And we need to recognize and, and we need to have a spirit and a heart that is cultivated by an understanding of what this does in our relationship with God and with other people. And that we're truly repentant, we're truly sorry. And again, you know, for many of you, this is, this is not new, but repentance has that, all, that whole idea about it that, that I'm heading in this direction. And, and that's towards sin. I, I'm, I'm drawn this way. My sinful nature and the acts of commission and omission are taking me this way. But then suddenly something stops me in my tracks and I realize that this is the wrong direction. And I turn around 180 degrees and I go back towards God and away from those sinful things. That's what repentance is all about, friends. It's really coming to God in confession and repentance the essence of 1 John 1, 9, and is saying to God, look, if I had to do that all over again, I wouldn't do it that way. I wouldn't say those words if I had to do it all over again. I wouldn't think those thoughts if I had to do it all over again. I wouldn't put myself in that position if I had to do it all over again. I wouldn't have done those actions if I had to do it all over again. That's what true repentance is about. And it's not for the faint of heart, and it's, simple faith, because that's what this series is called, but it's just not easy. And we live in an instant society where we just do so many things just so quick. It's, just, it's, a, it's a microwave culture that we live in. But when it comes to confession and repentance, you just can't rush it, friends. You just can't rush it. We need to take the time. That's why, you know, taking time every day in the, in, in the scripture, that's why having a personal quiet time or a devotional time, whatever, whatever you call it, we, we need to spend some time and we need to read. We need to read the Bible because that's God then speaking to us. But we need to take some quiet and some reflective time. And we need to examine our hearts and we need to invite the Holy Spirit to come and to put his finger on areas of my life, areas of your life, where they are displeasing to God, where we're not in agreement with God's standard, where we are sinning because we have this sinful human nature and we have a propensity towards sinning so we really need to take the time and look at the result psalm 32 and verse 5 then i acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity i said i will confess my transgressions to the lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. That's what 1 John 1, 9 is all about. That kind of attitude, that kind of heart, accompanied by those kinds of actions. Well, the third thing that I think John wants us to see in these five verses is this, that everyone has a defender. And here John now turns and he points to the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ's work on the cross actively affects you and I and should affect us every single day. Look at what chapter 2 and the first part of verse 1 says. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Now, notice there's a change in tone here. John has been defending the faith against these Gnostics who, who are teaching that, that only the spiritual really matters and that what you do in the flesh doesn't matter. So in other words, if you do sin, if you sin sexually or if you steal or if you lie or you say words that you shouldn't say or you have thoughts that are impure thoughts, the, the Gnostics were saying that doesn't matter as long as you're connected to God, as long as your spirit is in the right place. And John is saying, no, it really does matter. Because we have a sinful nature and we have acts of sin, but if we confess our sin, you see? Now John's tone completely changed. He says at the start of verse 1, my dear children, really literally what John is saying is, hey kids, <laughs> my little ones actually, it's a term of endearment. John goes into sort of full pastoral mode at this particular time. And he outlines for us test number two. The essence of what he's been trying to get us to pay attention to throughout these five verses. I write this to you so that you will not sin. Oh, perfection? Is that what John said? No, 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 no. That you will not sin. And we're going to see that it's not perfection he's talking about in just a second. But what John is trying to say and what John is concerned about 
is that people don't ignore that we have a sinful nature and that we need to put to death every single day our sinful nature. We need to get up every day and we need to say, okay, Lord, okay, my sinful nature, the natural me, the, the, the me that I have inherited from our first parents, Adam and Eve, and all the generations down through, is going to want to be selfish today, want to want to do its own thing, to seek my own pleasure, to seek, you know, to do things just my way. And I'm going to say some things, potentially, and I'm going to think some things, and I'm going to do some things that I know aren't right with you. So, hey, God, you know what? I put to death that sinful nature. I put it to death. And if you're a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ, and you were baptized, you will know that that's the symbolism right there at baptism. That you died and then you rose again in Christ. And so you say, so by the power of Jesus Christ today, I put to death that and I choose to live life by the Spirit. I mean, this is what Paul talked about all through Romans you know, chapter 6. So, we confess our sin as instructed in verse 9, but there's more good news to help us. And this is why we know that John's not talking about perfection. Look at the rest of verse 1. So he starts and he says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, Christian, remember he's writing to Christians, if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. John's words here are very, very unique. Really, really unique. In, in the Greek language, he uses a word and he calls Jesus our parakletos, is the original Greek word. And, and really what that word means is someone who comes alongside, someone who comes along as an advocate, as a lawyer, as a representative for you. It's, it's really a word that is used in a legal type of setting. So I could be accused, I am coming, I am being presented before the judge, but I have someone who is alongside me, who will represent me, who will defend me, who will advocate for me. And that person is Jesus. See, because Jesus died on our behalf, he stands before the Father representing us and identifying with us as he explains to the Father that we are his, that we are his disciples that we have given our lives to him, that we have prayed that prayer of salvation and we have been baptized and we are committing every day to be more like him because that's what discipleship is really all about. And so we have this defender. Now, Jesus is not pleading with the Father and he's not in some adversarial role with the Father, but he is representing us before the Father. Because, you see, there is this transaction that has happened when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus. Because Jesus died on the cross and then rose again, Jesus has paid the penalty. And John goes on to explain this. The basis on which we can be forgiven is the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, what Jesus did on Calvary for you and me is powerful and effective. Verse 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. See, according to verse 2, Jesus is our atoning sacrifice. The King James used to use the old word propitiation. Other translations will use uh, expiation here. And really, this is rooted in Old Testament sacrificial system language. But what this verse is talking about Regardless of the translation, and those are all good translations, the verse speaks about the work of Christ on the cross nearly 2,000 years ago, where God's penalty for sin was paid for. The offended holiness of God was satisfied through the death of Jesus Christ. The anger and the wrath of God that was poured out on sin was poured out on Jesus, the perfect one, the Lamb of God as John said, who takes away the sin of the world. And notice that it was for the sins of the whole world. And that doesn't mean some kind of a universalism. Sometimes people point to this and they say, oh, you see, everyone, and everyone in the end, regardless, is going to be saved. No, Jesus' sacrifice was sufficient to allow all to experience salvation. But coming to God is a choice that you and I need to make. We are drawn by the Holy Spirit, and you and I must put our faith in Jesus, and then we must walk with him every single day. But not only was what Jesus did effective 
like 2,000 years ago on Calvary. But because he is our advocate, because he is our parakletos, he is before the Father on a moment-by-moment, day-by-day basis. So do you see what's happening here? Our sinful nature is taken care of. What happened in Adam and Eve and the fall of all humanity, Jesus, the new Adam, the second Adam, has made all of that right by fully satisfying the offended holiness of God and dealing with our sinful nature. But on a day-by-day basis, as we make choices, hopefully most of them good to follow God, but sometimes we make bad choices and we commit sins of omission and sins of commission, Jesus is still representing us there before the Father. And that's why. That's why if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19 says, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. This is what God is doing. God's great rescue mission for humanity and for all of creation. So what then is the result of all of this? <laughs> Well, I think what John would say to us is, if we understand what's going on here, and there's a lot going on here, then we need to go back and look at chapter 2, verse 1. Because this is the second test of what it means to know for sure that you have eternal life. My dear children, kids, my little ones, I write this to you so that you will not sin. We will not have sin as a regular, ongoing part of our experience walking daily. We will not let the sinful nature rise up again. It has been put to death, but it needs to get put to death every single day and maybe even several times a day. But we will not walk by our old sinful nature. And we will be careful that we do not omit things that God has said we are to do, commanded us to do, and we will not do things that God has forbidden us to do. That's what this means. And that's the test of a true Christian. So is the test really then, Dave, oh, if I commit a sin, then I've lost my salvation? No, 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 no. On an ongoing basis. See, because he, when you do sin, then you confess and you repent. And you get right with God and you get right with other people again. See, friends, the second test of true Christianity is that we don't willingly keep on sin. We don't habitually keep on sinning. We do not have any besetting sins in our lives. We need to acknowledge our struggles, confess, repent, and find forgiveness in Jesus with the great hope and assurance that we don't have to repeat our sins because we have a Savior who is our defender, who is our advocate. In closing today, I really wanted to just share some Scripture verses with you. Because I can imagine that as I've been speaking today, that you know, some of you could be really struggling. Some of you know that you have habitual sin in some areas, that you have besetting sins in your life. Some of you are wondering about things that you've done and said or thought in the past, and you're wondering if if it's really been taken care of. Again, we can't let our feelings dictate our Christian experience. We We need to go outside of the subjective, and we need to appeal to something that is much more objective And what is really objective is the Word of God. This is the living, active words of our loving God to us. So let me close today by trying to anticipate what some of you are actually thinking and going through right now and by encouraging you with some verses. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You're feeling condemned about some past stuff in your life, but you know that you confessed it and you know you were sorry. Well, that's the work of the one who is the father of lies and the accuser of the saints because the word of God says in Romans 8, 1, therefore there is now no condemnation, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, 
they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. That's what God does for us. Elsewhere it says that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That's what Isaiah was talking about. Also, Isaiah 43 and verse 25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgression for my name's sake and remembers your sins no more. Forgive and forget is not in the Bible. God chooses not to remember any longer your sins when you confess them and when you repent from them. And so if you're struggling with guilt from the past over some things that you've said and done and thought, maybe you need to memorize Isaiah 43 and verse 25. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We are taken out of that kingdom of darkness, that sinful nature kingdom, the, 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 the kingdom where the sinful nature wants to belong and wants to operate and, and actually is a citizen of. And he has rescued us from that kingdom and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. And that's what happens when you and I come to faith in Jesus. And then finally, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Some of you know the besetting sins. You know your struggle areas. Don't go back to them. Start every day walking by the Spirit and not by the old nature and inviting the Lord to come and work so powerfully in your life. And those areas of temptation that you know are areas for you, you just stay way clear of them. You don't watch those programs. You don't go to those websites. You don't hang out with those people. You don't have those types of conversations. You don't read those books. And the list goes on. You know what they are. But what Galatians 5.1 is saying is for freedom that Christ has set you free. So don't let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Don't put that stuff around your neck. Well, friends, look, I know it's been a lot today, and I appreciate you hanging in there with me. I want to pray for you as uh, I close out this sermon, and so I'm going to invite you now, would you pray with me? So, Lord Jesus, a lot here, and uh, sin is something that all of us struggle with, and so, God, would you help us to turn to you and to your holy word that has the words of life and it is objective. It's not based on our feelings, but it's based on truth, the truth of God. And you have spoken, and you are all powerful, and you are all knowing. Lord, would you help us? Would you help us to not deliberately sin as a regular part of our everyday lives? But would you help us to live holy, pure lives that are pleasing to you? And we thank you that you never ask us to do anything, that you do not give us the power to do it. And so we invite you, Holy Spirit, to work powerfully in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, worship team is now going to lead us in a closing song.
Well, again, thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope, uh, a lot of information today, but I hope that you are encouraged that um, you're going to be able to go into this week and, and think through what the Apostle John has taught us, you know, in the Scripture and what God maybe has spoken to you about today, you know, uh, to not fall victim, you know, to the lies of the enemy and not to fall victim to sin in your own life, but to really stand your ground and, uh, you know, to practice confession and to talk with other people and to fellowship with other people uh, because uh, we we're never meant to do this alone. Well, I want to encourage you as you go out uh, this week into the week that you're facing, that God is with you and he is present and he cares about you and he loves you. And so would you go knowing that uh, his hand is upon you and his eye is upon you. God bless you and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.